to the militant feminist, marriage is prostitution, and the family is at best a failed institution and at worst a prison or slave quarters. Two decades ago, novelist Tony Morrison told Time magazine, I quote, the little nuclear family is a paradigm that doesn't work. In 1994, the Chicago Tribune quoted Judith Stacy, sociology professor at New York University Center of the Study of Gender and Sexuality, and she said, I quote, the belief that married couple families are superior is probably the most per pervasive prejudice in the Western world. The family is the primary site of female subjection, which is achieved largely through sexuality, said Marilyn French, author of the landmark social criticism, The War Against Women, which Gloria Steinem lauded. And I quote her, if you could read only one book about what's wrong with this country, the war against women is it. Like prostitution, marriage is an institution that is extremely oppressive and dangerous to women. Again, feminist author Andrea Dworkin. And so, then a logical conclusion follows. The nuclear family must be destroyed, and people must find better ways of living together. Whatever its ultimate meaning, the breakup of families now is an objectively revolutionary process, said the feminist Linda Gordon. So, destroy the family, and I let them speak for themselves. Not that I say so, that feminists do, do and say such things. Here, Minnesota radical feminists Nancy Lehman and Helen Fullinger say, say and I quote them, Male society sold us the idea of marriage. Now we know it is the institution that has failed us and we must work to destroy it. In the Jewish World Review in February 2000, in a piece titled Now, Pro-Fatherhood -fa Funding is Unconstitutional, Sheila Cronin, a radical feminist, the leader of the feminist organization Now, was quoted. And she said, since marriage constitutes slavery for women, it is clear that the women's movement must concentrate on attacking this institution. Freedom for women cannot be won without the abolition of marriage. In 1970, Robin Morgan, now the nanny of Gloria Steinem's love child, MS magazine, called marriage a slavery-like practice. We can't destroy the inequities between man and woman until we destroy marriage, she said. That same year, Morgan edited a book called Sisterhood is Powerful, containing an essay, among many others, written by Valerie Solanas, who was president of the Society for Cutting Up Men, SCUM. It is now technically possible to reproduce without the aid of males, and to produce only females, wrote Solanas. We must begin immediately to do so. The male is a biological accident. The male has made the world a shit pile. This is from uh, her scum manifesto, published in London by Phoenix Press in 1968, page number one. Not a lady to be trifled with, Valerie Solanas not only wrote the scum manifesto, which encouraged male, how to call it, gender side or something, and the creation of an all-female society, but she also established her bona fides by going out and shooting Andy Warhol. In late 1973, those two radical feminists from Minnesota that I, I already just mentioned, Nancy Lehman and Helen Fullinger, had circulated a new manifesto of the movement with titled Declaration of Feminism, which was broadly reproduced and widely praised. Right. And I quote from that. They said, marriage has existed for the benefit of man and has been a legally sanctioned method of control over women. We must work to destroy it. The end of the institution of marriage is a necessary condition for the liberation of women. Therefore, it is important for us to encourage women to leave their husbands and not to live individually with men. That's pretty much as good as it can get when it comes to describing their ideology. 
But, well, this one I like most. A woman needs a man like a fish needs a bicycle. That's Gloria Steinem's line, and it truly reflects the agenda I have been describing here today. One of the goals of these radical feminists is to reinforce to women the idea that men are obsolete, says Tammy Bruce in her book, The Death of Right and Wrong, Exposing the Left's Assault on Our Culture and Values, published in 2003. And I already showed another, her book a few weeks ago, uh, also a very good book, and what is amazing about this woman that she herself, up till very recently, was one of the leading feminists in this country. She actually was a head of uh, this uh, now chapter in Los Angeles, and, and she broke with that movement, cured herself from feminism. But she 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 is lesbian herself, so I hope she she, she eventually would cure herself from lesbianism also. And she is just great. And those books are just so good. Okay, and we are almost there. Women, like men, should not have to bear children. The destruction of the biological family will allow the emergence of new women and men different from any people who have previously existed, said Alison Jagger. The care of children is infinitely better left to the best trained practitioners of both sexes who have chosen it as a vocation. This would further undermine family structure while contributing to the freedom of women, said Kate Millett, an ambivalent feminist and the author of the 70s bestseller Sexual Politics. In order to raise, raise children with equality, we must take them away from families and communally raise them, said Dr. Mary Jo Bain, assistant professor of education at Wellesley College and associate director of the School Center for Research of Women. The cultural institutions which embody and enforce those interlocked aberrations, for instance, law, arts, religion, nation, nation states, the family, tribe, or commune based on father's right, these institutions are real and they must be destroyed. Again, this is what's said by Andrea Dworkin, and I will talk about her a little more in detail next time. Now, Judge Robert Bork identifies the pro-communist leanings of the radical feminist movement. He says, and I quote, in keeping with its progenitor, the new left of the 60s, feminism is fiercely anti-capitalist and pro-socialist. And then he says, it is in keeping with feminism, revolutionary neo-Marxism, that the movement attacks bourgeois culture on many fronts. Women who have been inside the feminist movement have themselves confirmed the Marxist ties of radical feminism. And as I mentioned one, according to Tammy Bruce, and I quote her, in order to attract a wide, as wide a base as possible, the 60s leftists hid their socialist sympathies and in some cases actual Communist Party membership. Well, Betty Friedan is a classic case, but I will talk about her next time in, in, in more detail. And here, before I finish today, as always, we can't avoid mentioning, well, mentioning unavoidable. In the United States, as it's happened, the earliest pioneers of the feminist movement were Jewish, says historian Howard Sacher, in his major book, history book, A History of the Jews in America, published in 1992. This is from page 833. Another quote, Jewish women have played a significant role in all aspects of the American feminist movement, says Joyce Antler on Internet's Jewish Encyclopedia. Well, what I said today is, no, not some, let's blame the Jews for the plague, which in this case would be feminism. No, not at all. It is simply an account of historical facts with rather very little commentary. As you could see, I, I, I allowed them to speak for themselves. 
by reading their qu quotes from what they said. But I also named names and many, many too many of those sound, yes, distinctly Jewish. This doesn't mean that all Jews are supportive of feminism or that all radical feminists are Jews. No, of course, that would be the most absurd thing to say, considering, for example, what attitudes toward women are there in, in Jewish Orthodox Hasidic communities. Well, I, I read just a couple of days ago on the website of Yediyat Acharanot, which is Israel's most widely read daily newspaper, a story about how in the Haredi Orthodox neighborhoods in Jerusalem on Fridays there are calls on the public to adhere to a complete separation between man and woman in certain areas of the city. The religious activists tour the streets and announce using megaphones that on some streets man and woman should walk on opposite sides of the road during the weekend. During the noon hours, when women go out for a stroll and the men go to the synagogue, men and women should walk on different sidewalks, one of those Orthodox Jews said. So, this is why saying that feminism is a Jewish thing wouldn't be true at all, and definitely very unfair to those Hasidic Jews in Jerusalem. But, well, it just happens somehow that in many historic events and movements and crimes and revolutions, always nine out of each ten of most prominent leaders somehow were and are Jewish. Well, just as it was enough to look at, let's say, so-called neocons behind Bush, nine out of ten Jewish, just like leaders of the so-called Russian Revolution were, or founding fathers of Soviet Gulag, or those in the leadership of Comintern, as well as the most prominent personalities in the Communist Party here in the United States. Nine out of ten, Jewish. Those scientists, for example, who created the most horrible weapons in human history, atomic bomb, hydrogen bomb, neutron bomb, chemical, biological weapons, out of each ten, nine were Jewish. Well, take then the KGB spies here in America, the Rosenbergs and, and all others. Out of the, each ten, nine were Jewish. Or Frankfurt School, or new leftist firebrands of the 60s. And I can continue on and on and on. Nine out of each ten always would be Jewish. So the same is true, of course, about the creation and leadership of the modern feminist movement. Most of them, yes, were Jewish. The co-founders of now were Betty Friedan, Susan Brown Miller, Shulamit Firestone, and Naomi Weinstein. Karen Lipschitz de Krau served as now's first president. Muriel Fox as its executive vice president. Gloria Steinem was the founder and editor of MS Magazine. Bella Abzak Phyllis Chesler, Letty Cotton Pogrebin, Vivian Gornick, all played prominent roles in spearheading feminist movement in the 60s and early 70s. Robin Morgan, Meredith Pax, and Drea Dworkin were among those especially active in the most radical wing of feminism, the so-called women's liberation movement. And, and according to writer Anne Rolfe, the women's movement was fueled 